Marty St. George joined JetBlue in 2006 as the leader of the network strategy and partnership team. Today, he leads JetBlue Airlines planning and commercial teams and also teaches classes at JetBlue University in Orlando, Florida. In his nine years at JetBlue, he's experienced record profits, occasional losses, ice storms and new airplane models, all while expanding JetBlue to almost 100 cities throughout North, Central, and South America. But Marty is most proud of the fact that JetBlue has won 11 consecutive JD Power Awards for highest airline customer satisfaction in North America. Before he came on board at JetBlue, Marty held various marketing, network, and strategy positions at both United and US Airways. He is a native of Boston, received a degree in civil engineering from MIT. Marty remains a Red Sox and Bruins fan despite being in New York City. Please help me welcome Mr. Marty St. George. Thank you, Jack. I, I, I really appreciate the fact they put the airline guy on right after the quote, if your product sucks, marketing can't fix it. Uh, and there are certainly those who may say to yourselves, why am I listening to an airline guy? Because this is not a, a segment that's well known for good marketing. Um, but notwithstanding, uh, I, I think the JetBlue story is actually a little bit different story. I actually struggled a little bit trying to figure out what to talk about. But Anatomy of the Campaign is actually a really good opportunity for me. Uh, this story is not going to be about a big campaign. It's actually about a very small campaign. Um, and it doesn't exactly fit John's story about failure, but it definitely shows um, the work you may need to do once you become a practitioner to get really good ideas done. You know, again, a lot of us heard Tom at dinner last night. We made a comment about how tough it is to get your ideas flew through. Uh, this is a campaign that spent a lot of time uh, on the floor getting rejuvenated. Uh, we'll tell a little about that story. Before I do that, I am going to talk a little bit about JetBlue. Uh, I do need to justify a little bit why I'm here. Um, so I'm going to do one, set, one page of advertising. Uh, first of all, how many people here have actually flown JetBlue? OK, for, given that we're in Lexington, Virginia, that's actually a pretty good number. So I very much appreciate that. Thank you very much. The rest of you, shame on you, because you're missing out on something. Um, but it, it, here's what I'd say. JetBlue, for those of you who have not flown JetBlue, everyone has flown us, you know. If you've not flown JetBlue, it is the best product of any airline in North America. Period, bar none, not really up for debate. Uh, and again, I've been doing this for many, many, many years. I've worked for different airlines. I can say that with complete confidence. And the good news is customers agree, because that's how you get 11 consecutive JD Power Awards. Uh, company's only 16 years old. Uh, we've got about 18,000 people. Uh, we fly as far north as Anchorage, Alaska. We fly as far south as Lima, Peru. Um, where we used to be the biggest airline in uh, the Caribbean, then two airlines bought each other, American and US Air bought each other, so now we're the second biggest. But big is actually not really an important part of what this brand stands for. What this brand is really about is about mission. So you see in the top right corner, you'll see the company's values. Uh, the founders of JetBlue, who founded the company in 2000, uh, started out with a mission they call Inspire Humanity. And I think they fundamentally realized that uh, something that really other airlines haven't quite figured out, it is still fundamentally a service business. Okay, if I want to fly this afternoon from New York to Florida, uh, I can fly American, I can fly Delta, I can fly United, I can fly Southwest, I can fly JetBlue, and in three hours I will be in Florida with my bag to go do whatever I want to do in Florida. People don't buy airplane tickets because they want to fly in an airplane. Well, I do, but I don't count. The airline people are a little bit different. People buy airplane tickets because they need to get somewhere. And we can all get you somewhere. And I think that the, the, the fundamental insight that the founders had was, you know what, there is an opportunity to differentiate yourself. When the entire industry is on a race to the bottom, the company that does not race to the bottom should win. And I think that's actually the JetBlue results. So uh, you know, one thing about the airline business, we have a lot of three-letter codes. So uh, it's a little morning, early in the morning, so I, I, it's risky to do you know, audience participation. But you know, if I say ORD, what does that mean? Chicago, okay, well, you guys, this is good, you guys are awake, this is good, or LAX. Okay, and ROA, you guys know ROA probably. Okay, so we all know every three-letter code because that's part of what we're supposed to do. There's actually a very important three-letter code that's important to you guys. I, I assume you guys use this here, Amanda, I'm not even sure. USP. You guys know what USPs are? They still talk about that in the 21st century? Yeah. Unique selling proposition, okay. What is your hook? And JetBlue has a million unique selling propositions. You know, we have the most leg room of any airline. We have 36 channels of live television at every seat for free, up to 100 on some, certain airplanes. We have 100 channels of XM radio. 
Uh, we have free Wi-Fi in the airplane, only airline with free Wi-Fi in North America. A, a lot of things that make it a great product. The biggest challenge we have is that it's an industry that has been completely commoditized. You know, if, if you were flying in 1995 and you come and fly in 2015 and you flew on one of the legacy airlines, you would not recognize the experience. The experience has changed dramatically. Everyone is on a race to the bottom. And the challenge we have, and this is actually one of the unforeseen impacts of the internet, uh, it's created that world of commoditization. You know, you go onto Expedia, you click sort by fare, who's got the lowest fare, that's the guy I'm gonna take. Well, you know, it's not always the lowest price that creates the greatest value. And in this industry, that's one of our big challenges. So one of the ways we do that is we actually try to have a different communication strategy. I'm just gonna show you one ad. More than anything, just sort of sets a tone as far as how we communicate. Dad, when I grow up, I want to be a pilot just like you. Not to work hard, son. I know, Dad. It's not everyone gets to fly for JetBlue. It's any planes, direct TV, and leather seats. But son, I don't fly for JetBlue. No wonder Mom left. <laughs> So this is the tone, this is the tone that our advertising follows. We have, uh, I've got a lot of ads like this, uh, one's enough, because I think you guys get the, get the point. Uh, we have to find a way to break through because, you know, it's funny, you do testing of advertising and we all do testing of advertising. And you put airline ads, you take off the pictures of the airplane because all airline marketers love pictures of airplanes. Okay, you take off a picture of the airplane, you take off the logos and you put them in front of customers and say, what airline is that? They can't tell. In fact, there are many times, as one airline's campaign, I won't say who it is, that customers look at it and they think it's a hotel chain because there's just nothing distinctive. So our goal was to make sure that our advertising actually could not be mistaken for anybody else's because it's an industry that's got so much sameness in it. And it's also a business where the expectation is that customers aren't going to trust, we know they don't trust advertising in general. Airline advertising specifically, they look at it and they say, you're talking at me. You're not talking with me. And I think what's interesting is you never know what's gonna resonate with a customer. So this is an image we tested with the customers. And it's funny, at the time it was sort of a throwaway, it was almost a bridge image in this presentation. And the customers went nuts over it, like, oh my God, that's me. And I'm like, what? What do you mean that's you? They said, that's me. Now, I think you look at these people, I don't think anyone's gonna identify themselves with any of these, we call them I people, okay? These I people, the core icon of our campaign. So we're like, what do you mean that's you? It's like, well, I'm pulling a bag. I pull a bag like that. That's me walking through an airport. And we did group after group after group, and people's like, that's me. Like, you get me. Like, when a customer says, they look at their ad and they see themselves, especially those images, okay, it's extremely powerful. So something that was a throwaway actually became something that was actually very important to us. Um, so from my perspective, being in a position where the customer sort of identifies with you as a brand is incredibly powerful. So let me, let me get into the campaign story. Um, listen, USPs are great. We're still trying to build the edge and the image around the brand. So this is an assignment we gave our agency. It was the fall of 2012, and we have a normal fall campaign. We've got our campaigns timed relatively well based on booking <coughs> windows, and that's the period people book for the sort of the peak winter, which for the Florida, for Caribbean, Florida, et cetera, a very important booking period for us. So our assignment was we've got to become more relevant in New York. We were being outspent seven or eight to one uh, by our base competitor in New York. We certainly had top brand presence, but we didn't have the mind presence on our product. Historically, JetBlue started out as an airline that flew to Florida. People said, yep, they go to Florida, I get it. You know, at that point, we're flying to 17 countries, we're now over 20 countries, but 17 countries in Central South America, Caribbean, nobody gave us any credit for it. So we said, we've really got to push international in New York because people don't get it. We also said we have no money because we never have any money. That's sort of, you know, as my team says, every, with, with working for me, every dollar's a prisoner. So, um, we, we knew we, we did have a little bit of budget, but it wasn't going to be a big campaign, nothing like what we'd see Delta do. And the other issue was we've got a time limit because fourth quarter of 2012, there was a lot of stuff going on. And when you don't have a lot of money, it's really important to make sure you've got an uninterrupted voice. So the question is, what's happening in fourth, fourth quarter of 2012? You got these two guys beating the snot out of each other. And for anyone who uh, has been a marketer in the, practice, in the practice for a while, you know elections are really dangerous because two things happen during elections. The first thing is, it, it, it's just, it's like, it's like sharks in the water. It's a lot of churn, a lot of noise, a lot of stuff going on. Um, it sort of sucks all the oxygen out of the room. And not only that, it sucks all the ad time out of the room because they buy every piece of ad time out there when you get down to this period. So 
the agency, we said to the agency, you have to be done by September 30th, because once October 1 comes, it's gonna be election, 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 and it's, any money we spend is gonna be completely wasted. So uh, the agency came back and they said, we have a fantastic agency, by the way. I know we have somebody from Martin Group. This is one of the siblings of Martin Group. Uh, great agency, they came back and said, what if I told you that instead of running away from the election, we want to embrace the election? And I said, I would tell you no, because that's not a good idea. And you know, it's funny, think about people marketing around elections. You know, some brands have done some stuff, like very innocuous stuff, like 7-Eleven used to do this thing where, you know, pick a red cup or a blue cup. But really, really like milk toast sorts of things. Uh, you know, some companies have tried something more risky. The great example is Pizza Hut. If anyone remembers what Pizza Hut did, you can look up the story. Uh, they did a challenge where uh, they would give $50,000 to a person at one of the presidential debates who would get up and ask a question and say, sausage or pepperoni? Um, you know, cute, okay, not that clever, but neither here nor there. They got ripped for it because it's still a democracy. Elections are really important. This election, really important. It's my own little ad, but that's all I'm going to say about it. Elections are really, really important, okay? And I think people got a little offended. Like, hey, listen, you know what? You can't make fun of the election. It's actually very important. And it's just something where you've got to know where the line is. And the line generally is stay away from the line because you just never know what's going to happen. So from our perspective, we were very, very nervous when the agency said they wanted to do that. So the agency said, okay, we want to come in and make this presentation and we get three ideas. Uh, and so, you know, we're all sitting there with our arms crossed because we're quite skeptical. Um, so here's where they came out. They came in, how many people have heard this threat? Okay, if so-and-so wins, I'm gonna leave the country. And you had it for Obama, it was a top Google search, you had it for Romney. If Romney wins, you're gonna leave the company. Uh, they said, you gave us a challenge, we gotta break through, we've gotta be respectful, you want to promote the fact you find 18 countries. We want you to give away one-way tickets if your candidate loses. So basically they had the whole thing rigged out where you could pick a candidate, if your candidate loses, we will fly you to another country to help you move. And they said, we have this whole integration on it, it's a great idea. Uh, we stopped and said, okay. So again, I've been doing this a long time. Agencies always bring three ideas. And the third idea, Tom will tell you, the third idea is always the best one. By definition, you save the best for last. And I said to the, to the uh, account director, I said, I just want to make a comment before we go to idea number two. Okay, if this is your first idea, I cannot imagine what the third one is because this is so good that if this is like the runner up, I cannot wait to see the third idea because the third idea is gonna be absolutely amazing. And they said, yeah, we don't have three ideas, it's just this one, we really like this one a lot. <laughs> um, and they did, they did really like it a lot. So they called it election protection. Um, there are a lot of hurdles to get election protection done. Um, because listen, it's an election, you've got to be very nervous. It was a very, very emotionally charged period um, during this time period. We knew it was going to be a very contentious area. So we had a lot of hurdles to get through. Uh, you know, the first one, we went to talk to our government affairs people, uh, the people who are in Washington every day lobbying, trying to get you know, matters done for us who want to get done. They said, no way you can do that. Really bad idea. Don't want it. Really? Why not? Well, you know what, we can't be seen as making fun of the process because it's very important. We have to deal with these people. We can't do anything partisan. So we had to continue to edit things because it was a little bit edgier when the thing first came out. We had to back it down a little bit. Um, we had the issue of creating the seats. You know, the original plan was it's a 2012 election. We want 2012 seats. So my pricing team said, I am not giving away 2012 seats to fly internationally in the winter. Like that's the peak period. That's a lot of money. I don't have that kind of money. So we put some hurdles around that to try to find a way to make that, make that work. And I'll give you more about that in a second. Uh, just to make things more interesting, the chairman of our board, who was one of the founders of JetBlue, one of our first investors, also was the head of the finance committee for Governor Romney. So at that point, uh, our CEO said, uh, listen, if you want to do it, you can do it, but you got to get the chairman to agree with it. And I want to make sure that he's comfortable with it. So um, I did what I call the tour of awkwardness. Uh, I stole that line from a friend of mine, but I really do like it. Uh, the tour of awkwardness, trying to have these awkward conversations, telling a board member something we want to do is really edgy. Turns out we actually had a second board member who was also raising a lot of money for Governor Romney, and we got that, that, we got that piece done too. So we did a lot of things in this package to try to tone it down a little bit. I think we still ended up with what ended up being a very good spot. Let me just try to play this real quick, and we'll talk about it in a second. Lots of promises will be made this election season. JetBlue is making sure at least one will be kept. If my candidate doesn't win, my guy loses, I would seriously consider leaving the country. I would go to Mexico, Barbados, Jamaica. I would leave the country. 
If things don't go your way, don't worry. Here's your chance to score a free one-way ticket out of the country. It's just another way they put you above all. This November, live free or fly. Don't forget to vote. So if you hear that last line, don't forget to vote, that was specifically done for our government affairs team because they said, no, 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 no. We can't have them picking between candidates. Just tell them to vote. I said, well, that's really dumb because that completely defeats the purpose of what, there's no edge in that. Like, I'm trying to create edge. This is not the League of Women Voters. This has to be something that's edgy. So we said, how about this? We'll make it, like, we'll make it get out to vote. Great. So at the very end, we was like, don't forget to vote, which she said really fast. Um, and of course, the, 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 the uh, government affairs people said, hey, wait a second. I thought, like, yeah, it did. It's right at the end. I think, well, they said it so fast. I'm like, is it in there or not? <laughs> it's in there. OK. Um, so and that, we're gonna, let me go through some of, the, um, uh, some of the activations. Obviously, everything's integrated these days, so we want to make something integrated. Some of this is animated later, but I just want to yeah, have a little more time to show you some of the things. So we had a landing page, which is where you picked. Uh, one of the things we actually positioned was that uh, and this is also one of the things to tone it down a little bit, was instead of creating this whole partisan issue of um, my candidate, people also had the communication, you know what, maybe it's just the guy you think is going to lose. You know, if you think that so-and-so is going to lose, you may not like him, but you can pick him because then you get a free ticket out of it. Um, so the way it worked was you could pick which country you want to go to. That was part of the deal. You learned a little about the country. You could see which companies lean Democratic, which countries lean Democrat, Republican. Um, there was actually a real-time poll as far as who these people were voting for, so you could see what was going on. You'll actually see an animation later where you'll see a map of the United States with um, the states lighting up red or, or blue. Every time somebody voted, the state from that state, it would light up red or blue, depending on how people voted. It's actually kind of fun to watch. So that you sort of voted like this. Uh, let me show. Uh, so we actually, we actually wanted to do street activations because, again, it's New York. We had to find a way to break through. And we made this seem like a real campaign. So we created our own election protection posters. We had, our, our, we had uh, street activations. Uh, I did it. The CEO of the agency did it. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we did everything we could, again, on a very shoestring budget to try to get some sort of free attention. Um, let me let's just play a couple of these real quick. These are just really quick snippets of results. This is how it worked. sit and watch every day. We had votes from all 50 states, and this only appeared in New York City. It, and we actually almost no paid media. We'll show a little bit of paid media next. Uh, we did have voters from all 50 states, which was nothing we ever expected. Um, let me try this one. This is... We did a little bit of paid media. Once it took off, we said, you know, we're going to spend a little money on this. We did a little bit of paid media to try to get it out there, try to get people focused on what was happening. And yeah, it sounds annoying. Okay, one more thing, one more video thing coming. Uh, but the real win for this was the amount of free media we got. And I'll give you the results in a second, but let's just show just a little snippet of some of the stuff that happened. Great for this. Captain actually has a deal for them. I absolutely love to see the airline is running a promotion called Election Protection. So 600 million free impressions. Over 100,000 social shares, votes from all 50 states for something that only appeared in New York. Way, way, way above anything we'd ever expected. Um, and as it turns out, uh, President Obama won. We did have many, many more tickets to give away. 2012 tickets, because it was a 2012 election, so we had a lottery out of all the hundreds of thousands of people who actually picked Governor Romney to lose, and in fact, that, or to win, and they, they won a ticket. 2012 tickets. Would you like to guess how many tickets were redeemed? Nobody wants to guess. 18 tickets. 18 tickets redeemed. So when my revenue management uh, vice president was so mad I gave away 2,000 tickets, I now have this example to say, you know what? It was all in good fun. We did not have any complaints like this thing's a scam. People sort of got the joke. So it ended up being incredibly effective for us. So here's what I want to close on, and then we'll have a little bit of time for questions. Um, uh, you know. Whether you show up with a client, whether you show up in an agency, it's really hard to fight for good ideas because you know what? Everyone has an opinion. You know, one of the things we talked about JetBlue and values, uh, there is a one sort of secret value at JetBlue which we call egalitarianism, which is everybody's opinion counts. And I will tell you, there are some great benefits for it. One of the best promotions, one of the best free promotions we ever did, ever in the history of JetBlue, was an idea from our general counsel. 
Uh, over a billion free impressions is about a $15,000 investment. That'll be another campaign story if I come back in a couple of years. Um, but it's incredibly valuable to have all these thought partners. And it's also really frustrating to have a lot of thought partners. Um, the challenge you have is what is finding the, what, what avenue can I find to snake my way through the feedback to know when to say, you know what, that completely blows my idea, and know when to say, you know what, I think I can find a way to make that work, and to know when you just give a head nod and try to get away with it. That's sort of your spectrum. But at the end of the day, um, good ideas win. And it's funny, you listen, customers hate advertising, they hate interacting with companies, uh, but one thing they do, they like fun. If you can find something that you think really has a hook, that is an incredibly powerful opportunity. Okay, so I have a couple minutes left for Q&A. Could be about this, could be about anything else. You know, you did ask John some good questions, not that there's any pressure, but I'll feel very intimidated. Yes, Jenna. So can you talk about a little bit, uh, or, sorry, can you talk a little bit about your latest product launch and what you're doing with that? So let, let me explain the campaign because, because for those who didn't see it, and if you go into BuzzFeed, HuffPost, it's out there. But uh, it's called Reach Across the Aisle. And basically, Reach Across the Aisle, uh, we did not look at it as an election promotion. In fact, we, did, we actually filmed Reach Across the Aisle almost a year ago. Well, the way Reach Across the Aisle was, we wanted to take a full airplane of customers and say, we have great news for everybody. You all are going to get a free trip anywhere you want to go that we fly. The, prob the only challenge is, all 150 of you have got to pick the same city. So the whole goal was, can they, on the airplane, find a way to come to agreement? So the goal of this was to find an, ex an unusually contentious point in the political discourse and say, you know what, I'm just going to leave this here. Uh, and let's show, sort of show a fun example of people campaigning. And we did, uh, we actually, fortunately, some of the stuff we had we couldn't use for releases and stuff, but we did have uh, exactly what we wanted. We had people debating. You know, they had to pick between domestic and international, which destination. I was very passionate on the airplane, but they did all finally agree to go to Costa Rica. I think it was Costa Rica. I think it was between Costa Rica and Turks and Caicos at the end. Um, but we did that because we do think uh, this is actually part of our brand. You know, think about what airlines do. Um, the core competency that we have actually is connecting people. It's either connecting you with your friends and family, it's connecting you with business or business opportunities, it's connecting you with places in the world you've never seen before, it's connecting you with fun, it could be connecting you with a million different things. That's what we do is connect people. Um, so being able to own that piece, I think is actually very helpful uh, because it's really not the way other airlines talk. So I think in that perspective, we think it's a great opportunity for us to sort of find that. Uh, we will have another election prom promotion for 2016. We're still debating what it's going to be, but uh, watch, this, watch this space. And I'll say after the success of this one, it will not only be in New York. Yes, sir? Uh, I haven't been on a JetBlue flight in a while, so I don't know if you all are into this, but I know this trend of brands trying to get creative with the safety demonstration videos. And I know <laughs> that was not you guys safety video. Or, uh, well, you know, it's a great question, and I'm... Uh, it's a topic of conversation often at JetBlue. Um, and it's funny because to date, I'm not saying it will never change, uh, to date we've actually chosen not to get in that safety video business for two reasons. The first one is uh, it's sort of been done. You know, everyone's done it. For those of you who fly Delta, I don't fly Delta a lot, but <laughs> by the third safety video, I'm like, okay, I get it. It's really funny. Thank you. Let's move on. Like, I feel like part of our deal is we, you know, we, our CEO, our last CEO and our current CEO both have the same mantra, which is, if Delta would do it, it's wrong for us. Um, and uh, I've got a lot more things to say about Delta, but we're being, we're being broadcast, so I won't. Um, but um, the other thing that I think is important is it's still a brand that's focused on humanity. We want that personal connection between the customer and the crew member. They, don't, they spend more time with in-flight crew members than anybody else. I like them in the aisle talking. I like them up interacting with customers. Um, you know, from my perspective, it's, you know, it's funny, we look at this positioning, we have the, I, I'll tell you a very quick story. We fly other airlines all the time, you know, buy tickets like regular people to go have this experience to see what other people are doing. So I was flying an airline called Virgin America, which mostly flies transcontinental. Uh, I'm sitting, and they do not have good legroom, unlike JetBlue, so I'm sort of sitting sideways on my laptop. Um, in the aisle seat, in the window seat is this woman also sitting sideways on her laptop. So we start talking, she worked for Gap. And we're flying from San Fran to New York, and she's talking about airlines. I love Virgin America. I used to fly United. I don't fly them anymore. 
I didn't tell her what I did. I said, did you ever fly JetBlue? She's like, yeah, I used to fly JetBlue, but I can't stand JetBlue. I don't want to fly JetBlue. I'm like, oh, great. Like, tell me why. She's like, you know what the problem with JetBlue is? They're always like talking to you. It's like, I don't want to talk to anybody. Like, I want to go to a kiosk. I want to put headphones on. It's like, I don't want to talk to people. Like, and, and the thing is, that's what the, I mean, J Virgin is very much positioned as high tech, low touch. Like, you order food and drinks from your TV screen. So I could sit there, push Diet Coke, and you know, five minutes later, a hand comes behind me holding out a Diet Coke. <laughs> okay, like, if I told my people, I really want you to be that person, like, they couldn't do it. We don't hire for that. I mean, we want that interaction. So we, we, we sort of haven't gone there. Um, I'm not saying we never will, because there are safety reasons why it's kind of nice to have it done the same way every time. And you do want people paying attention. But I, having, having that connection between customer and crew member is really important to me. A great question. I probably time for like one or two more. Yes, ma'am. Working for such a strong and sort of authentic brand, what are some other companies just across the industry that you really respect for you know, sort of what they're putting out there, their marketing messaging right now? Oh, you know, it's so funny. I've, I, there's this perception that marketing people um, like are, are like fanboys of looking at other people's commercials, and a lot of them are. Advertising people certainly are. I'm really not. Um, you know, I would say what's really important to me is, uh, and I think, let me give you my criteria and then talk about who I think fits it. Um, there's nothing more important to me than authenticity across the entire spectrum of how a brand communicates. And this is the one time we will call out Delta. Um, so they have, we've, if you've seen any of their campaigns, they've got Donald Sutherland, this voice of God talking, these beautiful pictures of airplanes and buildings, and they shoot it in black and white. It's just really, really stately commercials. Again, Anyone who puts airlines, uh, airplanes in an airline commercial, uh, I get no time for because I don't think that really actually works with customers, but put that aside for a second. The shots are beautiful. And then you look at the safety video and it's like laughy, laughy, jokey, jokey. I'm like, wait a second, like, are you serious or are you jokey? Like, which one are you gonna be? Um, so I think that, like, I, I, I hate the thought of inconsistency. Um, I, so to me, the people I admire the most are the ones who have a strategy and stick with it. Like a place, I, I won't say which of my two airlines was like this, but a place I worked before would say stuff like, we are a business airline, we're really focused on business. And then they continue to do stuff to screw business customers. And I used to say stuff like, for a business airline, why are we doing that? Well, but you know, we need to do that. I'm like, well then why do we say we're a business airline? Because customers like this, and why we won't take it away? Like, it's that internal contradiction I really struggle with. So I love the companies that have, from top to bottom, A to Z, that sort of unity of message. Um, you know, the easy ones would be to talk about you know, Apple and places like that, which I think do a relatively good job. Although honestly, I think their website, if you go do the e-commerce side of Apple, not so good, which I think is sort of surprising. You know, I love Target. Um, I think they do a really good job of being consistent. Um, you know, I, I, I know my counterpart up there a little bit, and uh, we compare notes. And you know, he uses this phrase, which I love. Uh, he says, I can walk into a store, and in 30 seconds, I can tell if the, if the, if the store manager is good or not. And I, because I told him the story, I can walk on an airplane, and I will look at the, infra, the, the number one flight attendant for five seconds, and I will know, is this gonna be a good flight or not? You just know. Um, and he says his job is, like, I've gotta make sure that I do what I can to make sure that all you know, 4,000 stores have just as good an experience as every other one. And that's exactly the challenge that we have. And I think the companies that don't focus on that, I struggle with. I'll go to the other side of the spectrum. Um, if you look at the low-cost structure, uh, um, the low cost world, uh, low cost airline world elsewhere in, 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 the, uh, in, in the world and in, in Europe, you know, companies like Ryanair, uh, they're very, very different than JetBlue. They're extremely bare bones. They charge for everything, but they are absolutely consistent in the way they communicate. You know what you get. I actually admire that. I think it's, a, it's not the model I like, but I think it's a great model. Okay, maybe one more and then no, I'm getting the hook. Yeah, Are we getting the hook now? You can answer while I get set up. Okay, good. People who have to go to class, feel free to get up. And yes. Can I go to class? I really like to go to class. <laughs> Uh, so the, the question is, how do you actually gauge like how bad the risk can be when you we, we give away two thousand tickets? Um, it, you know, we have history as far as how promotions generally do. Uh, we were extremely lucky that this promotion was so focused around um, a new president. So the way the reason we only had eighteen tickets redeemed was that the redemption period was inauguration day for like three weeks. So 
I would say January 20th until February 12th is one of the worst time periods of the year. Because you know, generally in the Northeast, kids go on school vacation like mid-February and beyond. So that period, because we're a leisure airline and carry a lot of leisure, leisure demand is actually pretty low. So we looked at it and said, you know what, I don't worry about people who would have bought tickets. I just worry about taking up seats of other people. And that's a time period where I have more empty seats than most of the year. If I had said I want to do that same promotion uh, you know, February 15th to March 15th, I probably wouldn't have gotten it done. So again, as a marketer, you've got to be, res you've got to be a responsible citizen. You can think you have the greatest idea in the world. It does actually have to continue to move the company's metrics forward. I mean, and you know, I, I, I don't want to stress this enough. And it sounds crass, but it's absolutely true. If what you're doing doesn't ultimately sell stuff, either short term or long term, it's probably the wrong thing to do. And honestly, I look at some of the ads that we do, they're still building a brand image that people have, like the bell goes off, say, yeah, JetBlue's different, I want to align with them. Even if it's not directly, you know, sort of bottom of funnel focused. Okay, any more? Marty, redemption on that type of a program never exceeds more than 20%. Anyway. Yeah, you, you, you have a lot of breakage and stuff like that. And the beauty of this is when it's something fun, people don't, it's, it's different when you go to Staples and you want a rebate. It's like, you know, okay, where's my rebate? Like, right, it's, it's been a month, where's my rebate? That's sort of part of the deal. Promotions like this, it's a little bit more fun. It's like, yeah, maybe I get it, maybe I don't. I mean, we obviously fulfill everything because it's really important because we, we made that commitment, but the breakage is much, much higher. I mean, we have, and we've, and we've had breakage as low as, 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 as low as 50%, but usually it's, usually it's 75, 80% breakage, not 98% breakage, <laughs> or 99% breakage. Okay, great guys, thank you all so much. Thanks, Sean.